virtual meetings, general virtual meetings. The slides and the recordings are available and it's provided some FAQs um, on those meetings. Uh, and lastly, um, I'm aware from practice in Scotland that Aberdeenshire Council has a suite of documents uh, for virtual hearings and has conducted uh, many hearings, including I understand licensing hearings. So those documents uh, can be made available to you if you wish. So with that, over to Rishi. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, James. I'm just going to start today's session by providing an overview, as James said, and um, in particular, I'm going to look at um, which regulations apply to licensing hearings, how they interact and what you can or need to do in respect of um, rules of procedure at this time. Um, so the starting point, really, which remains unchanged, is that the licensing hearings under the Licensing Act, licensing Act 2003 continue to be governed by that Act and indeed the 2005 hearing regulations made under that Act. So to the extent that you're concerned with applications under the Licensing Act um, 2003, those regulations continue to apply and so those are the rules that you need to be concerned with. Um, I expect that everyone who's dialed in um, this morning to be familiar with those provisions, um, but it is worth stating that essentially the hearing regs do provide a wide degree of flexibility to licensing authorities. Um, and so it's still within a, you know, each authority to determine their own uh, rules of procedure. So the regulations are just a baseline. Um, I'll also just touch very quickly on taxi licensing issues because of course there are no specific regulations about those hearings. And so again, that will just come down very much to what um, your own constitution provides for in terms of um, particular standing orders, et cetera. Um, with taxi licensing, it is, there is a, a strong um, need to consider issues such as fairness and natural justice. Um, but again, um, these should hopefully be built into your existing procedures already. So what then about the Flexibility Regs 2020, which came into force last month? In the interest of full disclosure, I should probably first say that the regulations are actually called, um, and I'll need to read this out, the Local Authorities and Police and Crime Panels Coronavirus Flexibility of Local Authority and Police and Crime Panel Meetings, England and Wales Regulations 2020. So I hope you won't mind that we've just been forced to make up um, our own name for it, because even an acronym in these circumstances would be too unwieldy. Um, but going back to substance, one of the questions we have received quite frequently over the last few weeks is whether these regulations apply to licensing hearings at all. The short answer is yes, they do. Slightly longer answer is that um, the regs actually make it quite clear in, their, um, in how they're drafted. So one, um, they actually say that they apply to all local authority meetings and this includes committees and subcommittees. Um, so you're caught in that way. Second, the individual provisions themselves also state that they apply in respect of a reference in any enactment to a meeting of a local authority. And so this, you know, the, this would presumably tie in with, um, you know, the enactments like the Licensing Act or the regulations. Um, but just bear in mind that the provisions on remote hearings only apply in England, not in Wales. So there is that distinction and you, you know, depends um, where your authority is. Um, so what do the regulations say? Um, as far as is relevant to licensing hearings, there are um, four points. Um, so uh, first, um, the meetings can be held remotely um, and that anything that uh, you know, is in your standing orders that actually prevents that just are deemed to be disapplied. The second is that public and press access can also be through remote means. Um, now, the regulations aren't very prescriptive about any of these, um, of these provisions, and so it really leaves it to the discretion of the local authority how you want to, um, you know, provide for remote access. And um, some of the other panelists will be talking about the practical considerations of, you know, choosing what means you want to use. Uh, the third is that um, you do have a power under the, the 2020 regs to make standing orders for remote attendance. And so this will be used particularly if you want to um, overcome practical issues dealing with voting or public access to documents or public participation. 
And then finally, um, you can hold and alter meetings without further notice. Um, now, this provision, it's just worth stating here that actually it deals only with further notice. So to the extent that there are obligations to give a party's initial notice of a meeting, those still bite and they remain unchanged. What does change is this element of further notice. And yes, you do have more flexibility, but again, it's just worth remembering um, that to the extent that you're using such flexible powers, um, you always consider issues of um, common law fairness and natural justice. So, uh, you know, particularly if you're considering uh, uh, CHAXI licensing application, um, for example, where someone's livelihood is at stake, um, it's important that you give sufficient notice and not simply arbitrarily kind of use your powers in a way that would prejudice um, the, the applicant. Um, right, I can't seem to change. Okay, no, got it. Um, fine. I'm going to turn then to look at um, the uh, rules of procedure that govern your meetings. And um, the starting point here will be your constitution. And this varies massively from authority to authority. Um, the, the, so you will have rules already. And as far as the remote, um, reg, the flexibility regulations are concerned, there, there's no need as such to actually amend or make a new rule of procedure or standing order just to avail of the remote meetings because that much is permitted by the flexibility regs themselves. Um, in fact, what the regs say is that um, the provisions in, in the regulations apply notwithstanding any restriction contained in any existing standing order that you, you, the council has. Um, so you don't actually need to take any active steps to change your constitution or your rules of procedure to simply host a virtual meeting. That being said, you do have the option of doing so under the regs. Um, we would advise that, to the extent possible, um, work within your existing rules. If there is something in your existing rules that would be practically impossible to satisfy in the virtual context, then yes, in, in those circumstances, you would need to you know, make a new standing order, amend an existing one. Um, but even then, what we would advise is be you know, quite specific, ensure that all you're changing is just in respect of virtual meetings, um, and at the same time, don't be too prescriptive because this is shifting territory and you don't want to bind yourself saying, oh, we're now going to you know, use Zoom for all meetings when actually you might realize that something, some other program works better for you. Um, and then ultimately, when it comes to changing um, or amending standing orders, um, the way to do it will really depend on your constitution. Um, this will, as I've said repeatedly, this will vary from constitution to constitution. Uh, most commonly, constitutions do require that amendments to standing orders and indeed the constitution can only be approved by full council. Um, there will be some examples where you can amend using um, a, you know, delegated or emergency powers, but of course, be mindful of you know, what you're trying to achieve and um, always just be guided one by a constitution and two by general public law principles. So if you do use delegated powers, ensure that you're using them properly and for a proper purpose and um, you know, only taking into account relevant considerations. Um, so that's the rules of procedure. One thing you might want to consider is uh, adopting a new protocol or several different protocols um, to, to help with um, virtual meetings. Now, protocols depends what you what um, you know what you're trying to achieve. But what um, we're suggesting in the sense of protocols is not actually rules of procedure, but just um, kind of rules, not rules, but uh, guidelines or principles setting out good practice and good etiquette. And I know a number of local authorities that have begun to adopt these uh, protocols and just provide um, you know basic kind of um, uh, guidance. Things like you know, ensure your phone's turned off, and essentially a step-by-step -step process um, that enables people to join these meetings and tells them um, how to conduct themselves during the meeting. So, for example, muting themselves so that they're not disruptive, um, and that indeed is something that we're doing right now. So, while I'm speaking, everyone else is muting themselves to um, avoid background noise. Um, and then the final thing that I will uh, just touch upon is urgent decision making. Um, and this may be um, 
required in these times, particularly, for example, if you have, um, you know, a taxi uh, licensing issue where there's um, a danger being posed to the public and you need to exercise um, your powers quite quickly and overnight. Um, in these situations, you're likely to have delegated powers. Um, but again, it will depend from um, constitution to constitution. Um, there is, however, no power to delegate um, certain decisions. So, for example, uh, where you have Licensing Act decisions and you've received relevant representations in response to an application, those kind of decisions do need to go to committee. So, you know, be mindful of that and you uh, just work within what the Act provides and also um, what your constitution says. Um, on that note now, I will hand over to um, Ben. Thank you, Ruchi, and uh, good morning, everyone. As set out on that first slide, I'm covering certain matters um, to consider and issues which might arise before a hearing. Most of what I say is specifically in relation to premises licensing hearings, but some of the more general principles will also be relevant to other types of licensing hearing. Um, you'll be aware, for example, of the advertisement requirements set out in Regulation 25 of the Licensing Act regs, um, familiar to you all, requiring advertisements to be by way of blue notice, displayed prominently at the premises or on um, the premises um, for a period of 28 days and putting an advert in a local newspaper or if there isn't a newspaper, a circular or newsletter circulating in the vicinity of the premises. Now, of course, those requirements remain in place and wherever possible they should be adhered to. But the, it's obvious that the um, current circumstances mean that print newspapers may not be so widely in circulation or they might not be being purchased and blue notices are less likely to be seen um, given restrictions on movement. Um, so instead of hard copy advertisement, publishing the notices um, on the website of a newspaper or similar circular may mean that in fact they're more likely to be seen by those living in the vicinity of the premises. Um, and similarly the requirement under Regulation 38 to advertise license um, reviews at the offices of the licensing authority in a central and conspicuous place um, would appear to be unlikely to lead, to lead to effective public notification in the circumstances. Um, and therefore, in addition to compliance so far as possible with the regulatory requirements, it's going to be necessary for authorities to take further or alternative steps. Um, for example, a licensing authority might wish to and is advised by MHCLG to do so to maintain a page of licensing notices on its website. Um, this should include, I would suggest, the full details of the application as well as any supporting documents as it's unlikely that visiting an authority to inspect the application is going to be feasible um, for the time being. In addition, I know that um, certain authorities from when I've gone around the country doing licensing training with councillors, they informally um, notify ward councillors uh, and residence groups of applications and relevant um, matters in their area. Um, this is another method which can be used to further public participation um, and make sure that there's effective public notification at present. And it's also a measure recommended by MHCLG um, in the current circumstances. If um, procedural irregularities do occur because of the COVID-19 restrictions, um, my view is that the courts are unlikely to interfere with any decision provided that there's been substantial compliance with the regulations um, and the, reg the relevant regulatory requirements, especially um, where the licensing authority is able to demonstrate that it's employed the best practical means um, in the circumstances to minimise any prejudice um, to any party. Um, just before I move on from this issue, it's worth noting that so far as premises licences are concerned, the relevant statutory periods for the making of representations, um, that 28 day period will continue to apply and late representations remain inadmissible. Um, there was a question raised, which I'll address in a moment about late evidence, um, but this is just about representations that are received. Richie, if you can move to the next slide, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Um, so 
the, the next topic is about enabling um, the public to attend and others are going to talk more about public participation and the participation of other um, parties during the hearing. But at the time when the hearing is advertised, I suggest that the platform um, that you're going to be using, if it's Zoom or, or whatever it might be, um, should be notified to the public as well as providing clear instructions as to how to join the hearing. Um, I think Matt will talk about some practicalities, but it will be up to each authority to identify the most appropriate video conferencing app or, or whatever means they're going to use to meet their needs. Um, we had a question in from Shelley Bowman at Rushmore Borough Council about whether to update um, the authority's protocol for the holding of hearings. Um, and in my view, this will be very important to do. Ruchi has already touched upon the subject, but updating the protocol will help to inform the parties and the public as the expectations regarding participation ahead of the remote hearing. Most, if not all, authorities will have standard protocols for in-person hearings, and it would seem sensible to update um, that protocol, make it available in advance to the parties and to the public, um, to deal with any changes which might be necessary to smooth, um, smooth out the running of remote hearings. It should mean that hopefully uh, parties understand in advance of the hearing and can prepare accordingly um, with the expectations of the committee uh, to ensure that their participation at the hearing is, is effective and as in, is in line with um, how the authority want these matters to uh, run. The other matter, just to say a few words about ahead of a hearing and thinking about prep is, is documents. More than ever, it's become necessary for us all to work electronically. And um, it, it's also going to be necessary to ensure that the parties have access to the same documents and those documents can easily be referred to during the hearing. Probably a single paginated bundle is going to be the easiest way um, to work and making sure that this is available to the parties well in advance of the hearing um, with an index etc will just make preparation and participation in the hearing a altogether smoother process hopefully. Um, additionally authorities might find that the receipt of paper licenses and, and representations is administratively problematic if you have um, officers who are home working um, and therefore I would suggest that encouraging electronic applications and electronic representations to be made um, will be the easiest way to proceed but of course authorities will still need to have in place procedures to monitor anything that might come in in a non-electronic form and to have forwarding facilities in place. No doubt that's something everyone has already thought about. Um, finally on the dealing with the issues before a he hearing and probably also relevant at a hearing. Um, in answer to a question asked both by Clyde Mason at Reading Borough Council and also um, Lenita Brewer at the London Borough of Redbridge, um, the normal rules will continue to apply so far as license, the premises license hearings are concerned in respect of late evidence. Any evidence relied on needs to be produced before the hearing and it's only with the consent of parties that late evidence can be admitted at the hearing. Um, in the context of remote hearings, the production of late documentary evidence at the hearing is likely to create um, obvious administrative issues and does risk undermining the process. So it, that rule seems to me even more important in the circumstances. Um, it will be for the committee to decide whether to admit the evidence applying that regulatory test, and that is something which legal advisors have of course, um, can give advice on. Um, on that, I'll hand over, I think, to Joe at this stage to deal with the next issue. Thanks, Ben. Morning, everyone. Um, Richard, could you just go on to the, my first slide? That's great. Um, so I'm going to deal with what happens at, at the hearing. You've got your remote hearing on. Um, although before I leap into the hearing, I'm going to deal with the question of adjournments, whether that hearing can be adjourned and the basic point is the same as has been made already by Ruchi and Ben which is that the um, flexibility reg uh, regulations and coronavirus generally hasn't really changed the rules. The um, hearings regs uh, 2005 still remain extant 
um, and all it does is provide some flexibility to those. So the, the position that you're all used to about adjournments, which is that um, hearings can be adjourned in accordance with regulations 11 through 13, remain the same. A couple of points to make about that though. First of all, those powers, so Reg 11 is the power to extend time, Reg 12 is the power to adjourn and, and Reg 13 is the caveat that you can't use those powers to override prohibitions and so on. Um, both 11 and 12 uh, uh, require that any adjournment or extension of time is to a specified date. So you can't use those powers to adjourn matters generally or sine die or, or um, for the time being or until the end of coronavirus or the lockdown or whatever. It has to be a, a specific date. So that, that power is um, circumscribed in that way. And, and you should just uh, remember that the powers to adjourn hearings are available in respect of all hearings but there are certain types of hearings the main ones being summary review hearings and and reviews after closure orders uh, where the matter has to be determined within the statutory time period rather than a hearing held so for normal licensing hearings uh, the requirement is that a hearing is held within 20 days which allows for the hearing to be opened within the 20 days and then adjourned if necessary uh, but for the more urgent matters, closure orders, summary reviews, etc., um, the requirement is to determine it within the 20 days. And, and Regulation 13 provides that the power to extend time can't override that requirement. Um, should you adjourn? Uh, well, coronavirus doesn't, at least according to the government, uh, provide a general justification for adjournment. So in Kit Malthouse's letter of the 8th of April, an extract of which you can see on the screen, um, he expressed the view that hearings should proceed wherever possible. So there's a power in the flex regs uh, to defer hearings to a specified date, but uh, hearings should proceed where, wherever possible. And for all the reasons set out by Ben and in due course, Matt, um, you can definitely hold remote hearings. And so the, the lockdown and restrictions on movement and so on shouldn't by themselves provide a, a reason to adjourn. Um, Insofar as there was ever any question about this, and I don't think in truth there was, uh, hearings, subcommittee hearings can now definitely be held both in public, which is the requirement, and remotely. That's regulation five of the flexibility regulations. And just to pick up a point that John Barton asked this morning on the Q&A function, um, although the flex regs talk about meetings, local authority meetings, and of course, Licensing Act 2003 talks about hearings, Regulation three of the flex regs, which is the interpretation section, uh, says that uh, local authority meetings, that phrase should be defined to include a subcommittee of a local authority. So licensing subcommittees are definitely included in that. So all of the flexibility provided by regulation five applies to uh, subcommittee hearings. And of course, in terms of um, managing your remote hearing, once you've decided not to allow an adjournment and get on with it, is what Matt Lewin is going to talk about uh, in due course. Um, so can we go to the next slide then, please, Ruchi? Uh, questions and cross-examination once the hearing starts. Well, again, the, the basic rule, the general rule, which hasn't changed, uh, is that there shouldn't be cross-examination. You shouldn't allow wigs and gowns uh, unless it's required in order to deal with the representations that you're there to deal with in the subcommittee. Um, my view, so that hasn't changed. Um, my view is that it is less likely to be satisfied, that test that cross-examination is necessary where a hearing is remote, largely because of all the parts of a hearing that remote hearings can deal with. I think cross-examination is the hardest, that kind of um, back and forth um, question from one answer from another just doesn't work as well uh, on, in the remote platform and is likely to cause more problems rather than fewer problems. So, so my feeling is that um, chairs of subcommittees will be less rather than more likely to uh, find that cross-examination is uh, required. So I think we'll see even less of that than we do uh, normally. Uh, in terms of questions, well, they should proceed in the normal way, but you will need when you're running your hearings to um, have a, a, at least one eye on how they will be managed, whether there's a hand up function. Zoom, for example, has a function to sort of remotely raise your hand or virtually raise your hand. Um, the other thing which is really a practical thing is that there's sometimes a bit of a time lag between one person finishing speaking and the next person starting so you need to uh, allow a little bit of extra time to make sure the question's been heard and just a point for um, 
those who might be making representations and participating in the remote hearing, uh, just ask yourself the question, would, would, would my proposed question not be better made or the point behind it by submissions where you can just kind of rattle on without a back and forth? Again, I think the remote hearing setup is less suited to um, an interchange of points than it is to um, five or ten minutes of making submissions. So quite often as the reason for a question is to make a point, ask yourself if you're presenting would this just be better kept for my time and or, or the summing up? Um, ne next slide, please, Richie. So this is um, the, the power to exclude the public. And again, um, the hearings regs contain uh, two powers, as you all know, uh, to exclude uh, the, the public from hearing or, or people. Uh, Regulation 14.2 is where it's in the public interest to do so. And Regulation 25 is where someone's being disruptive. Both of those powers um, apply just as much to people who are parties to the hearing as to people who are observing or, or um, sitting at the back or, or whatever. Um, the, the first of the powers um, where it's in the public interest, that usually covers things like um, uh, confidential legal advice, um, sensitive information, uh, where I've seen it used quite often is where in summary reviews where something has happened and the criminal investigation is at a very early stage and the police want to show something which will definitely form part of the criminal investigation but don't want to show all of the members of the public um, what it is and, and again um, what you need to do is find a way of excluding the public. Now there's a bunch of possibilities depending on what platform uh, you could uh, end the meeting, um, set up a private meeting with only those who you want to see or hear the information. Uh, Zoom has a break, a very useful breakout rooms function, which I'll come back to in a minute uh, in a different context, um, which means that certain participants are then in a sort of private room and the rest of the participants can't see or hear them. Uh, or you might have a separate channel, um, for example, WhatsApp, for example, the panellists today the five of us have a WhatsApp group open so we can communicate between ourselves privately without you guys he hearing or reading what we're saying. Um, that's again, could be a useful thing to do in a, in a hearing. Um, last point, the disruptive uh, point. The, the one thing that I think arises here in terms of remote hearings is obviously you can remove somebody using the platform. You can just exclude them from the meeting, but how do you stop them just immediately coming back? Um, I think the answer is that if you password protect the meeting or provide some uh, mechanism whereby the host uh, can control whether someone comes in or not, then you can exclude someone and exclude them permanently. But remember that Regulation 25, first of all, includes the caveat that you can exclude them uh, until certain conditions are met, i.e. they come back and are going to be quiet or come back and stop doing whatever they were doing. So you need to be live to that. It's not binary. Um, and secondly, that if you do remove somebody for being disruptive, uh, you're then required to allow them to submit whatever they might have said or could have said in writing before the end of the hearing. So you just need to be mindful of giving them an opportunity to uh, to do that. Um, thank you, Ruchi. Read my mind that the next slide was coming up. Um, at the hearing, deliberations. Well, um, this is usually done in private unless you're Camden. I don't know if anyone from Camden is on the screen, but Camden are the only authority I know that do their deliberations in public. So. I won't deal with that. They, they can be done in public, um, but um, generally they're done in private and my view is for good reasons. Uh, how do you do that? Well, again, a bunch of options. You could end the meeting completely. So end the Zoom uh, session and start a new private Zoom just between the three members of the subcommittee uh, and the legal advisor. Uh, you could use the breakout rooms function uh, in Zoom. But I think one thing that will, um, play into what you decide to do is what you're going to do about the decision which is the next point um, as you know the uh, hearings regs require in most cases to make a determination within five working days and then notify forthwith now in my view the remote hearing setup provides even more justification for taking that time and basically providing the decision later um, I can see the problem that you get to the end of the hearing part, the evidence part of the hearing, and then you go off into private session, however you do it, for an hour, it can be longer. People aren't going to want to wait around, it might be difficult to um, 
to notify people that you're ready to give a decision and so on and so forth. So my view is that it's probably better in these circumstances, remote hearings, to uh, use as many of those five working days as you want to make the determination and, and send the uh, decision out uh, in, in writing by email. You, you could, uh, when you'd reach the decision, send a summary, which is sort of the remote equivalent to reading out who's won and who hasn't won, further reasons to follow but my view is that you can well within the regulations uh, end the meeting at the, at the public part of the meeting at the end of the uh, evidence part uh, and then go into private deliberation the one issue there is that if something comes up which it sometimes does that you want more input from uh, if the meeting's ended you're not going to be able to go back and do it and then appeals there isn't very much to say about appeals um, obviously you still have to send out people's appeal rights uh, with, with the decision, um, don't forget to do that. I think the reality here is that if licensing appeals go uh, happen, you know, if, they're, if they're put in, obviously they go to the Magistrates Court. My experience so far is that the Magistrates Court are not um, at the forefront of uh, adopting remote technology, um, they're not doing a great deal of it that way. They've obviously got a, an urgent list of custody cases which have to be dealt with. Uh, my feeling is that licensing appeals, if they weren't already pretty low on a magistrate's agenda, uh, are now much lower. Um, so I don't see that licensing appeals are going to get heard any quicker in this time. Um, and I just make the suggestion, partly out of self-interest, being a mediator, some of you will know, um, that in this case, in, the, in this time where there is a backlog, uh, might mediation or some form of ADR to dispense with the appeal be a better approach than waiting for six months to a year before your appeal that uh, comes on. So I think that's, um, those are all uh, my slides. So I'm going to hand uh, over to Matt now um, to give you some practical tips. Thanks Joe. So some practical tips on how to host and webcast your meeting. Now I've structured it in this way deliberately because I think um, in order to avoid what I'll call a South Somerset situation and if you aren't avid readers of Somerset Live, um, the local newspaper for Somerset, then I'll have to explain in a moment what a South Somerset situation is. Um, but I think you want to draw a distinction between hosting your meeting on a video conferencing platform with the people that need to be actually part of the meeting and speaking at the meeting and then separately webcasting the meeting so that members of the public can attend. So your first step is to choose the video conferencing platform. There are tons available. We're obviously using Zoom at the moment and uh, Zoom's uh, numbers have absolutely skyrocketed and all of a sudden uh, you might be a bit like me and I've done Pilates classes, I've, done, I've watched a Shakespeare production, um, I've done pub quizzes, I've played bingo, all on Zoom. And these were not things that Zoom was ever designed to use. And so it's not surprising that um, a lot of uh, attention has suddenly been given to Zoom and its security functions. And I think a lot of that has actually been a bit overblown. And I think a, a lot of the problems, indeed the South Somerset situation, probably come from people not locking down their meetings in an appropriate way. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So I think Zoom is a fine function to use. And obviously it has the advantage that um, almost all of us, and certainly a lot of your councillors, will probably have used Zoom in the last couple of weeks, so it will be familiar to them. Secondly, there are two Microsoft products. Uh, one is called Skype for Business, and that's been used by the courts, uh, but that's slowly going to be phased out and replaced by Microsoft Teams. Now, I know lots of our, our local authority clients already use Microsoft Teams, uh, and they have um, a video conferencing feature, and you can broadcast direct from uh, Microsoft Teams. You can do that also with Zoom. And one issue that I think has cropped up in uh, the experience of some of the authorities in Scotland is that uh, Skype for Business and possibly Teams as well automatically shows everybody's email address, which is fine if it's just an internal call, less fine if you're dealing with external participants. And I'm not quite sure what the workaround uh, with that one is, but you might want to talk to your colleagues in IT. Finally, there's um, Webex by Cisco. I've not personally used this product, but it's a very popular one in America, and Cisco is obviously a well-recognized IT company. One of the advantages, a bit like uh, Zoom, is that it's free to use, or at least initially. So once you've chosen your video conferencing platform, you want to invite uh, councillors, obviously officers, responsible authorities, and anyone who's entitled to address the meeting. So in the premises licensing context, those are people that have made relevant representations. Um, if you attended our previous webinar, you'll have heard the distinction we drew between a meeting in public, which this is, rather than a public meeting. So people can attend, but they don't necessarily have a right to speak. And that's obviously reinforced by the hearing regulations. Only if you've made relevant representations are you entitled to address the meeting.
Now, a lot of um, local authorities already have fantastic webcasting infrastructure installed. Unfortunately, it's in the council chamber, which isn't much use for the time being. Um, but Public Eye, which most of our local authority clients use for their webcasting services, have an excellent guide on how to do it. And the basic idea, which may be illustrated by that um, diagram below, is that you've got the video conferencing, uh, the video conference taking place on one platform, and then it's connected to another platform, which then broadcasts the meeting uh, online. It might be through the council's website, it might be a live stream on YouTube, could even be an Instagram story. Um, the idea is to create a separation between the people that need to participate in the meeting and the people that only need to watch the meeting passively. And that's in order to avoid what hopefully you'll see on the next slide. Oh, one more slide to come. It's a South Somerset situation. situation. I'll come back to that. Okay, so preparation is really crucial. If you're adopting a protocol for remote meetings, make sure all participants um, are familiar with it. So there are no um, surprises. You're managing expectations. Um, identifying speakers in advance is going to be crucial so that you can ensure that everybody's technology is working properly and you've got a speaking order and somebody um, who knows when to switch to who is supposed to be speaking. And um, Ben and Joe have already talked about this. Do as much as you can before the meeting, particularly with written evidence and submissions, which will hopefully uh, mitigate against the risk of IT problems uh, occurring during the meeting. So at least the material is there for your subcommittee, your committee to take into account. Security settings are really crucial. Um, if you have a look at your Zoom security settings, if you're a host of a meeting, you'd be surprised how um, open they are. And that's not perhaps not that surprising because it was designed as a business product. And we're obviously using it for different purposes. So make sure you're restricting things like the chat function, screen sharing function, um, perhaps automatically by default uh, muting participants so that you don't get um, Zoom bombers and Microsoft team trolls and people like that disrupting your meeting. Uh, and don't broadcast your uh, detail, the details of the meeting online indiscriminately. Um, I think you want to do it in a much more controlled way. As I said a moment ago, limiting participants to the meeting to the people who actually need to be a part of it. Okay. And finally, contingency plans, obviously, a plan for dealing with IT problems and uh, disruptions. And we actually had a really uh, sensible suggestion uh, in our questions um, from Guy at Merton, I think. Uh, and that was maybe to have a fourth councillor on standby, a bit like how we would do in a normal meeting in case there's an objection um, by a party to their hearing, uh, hearing the item. A fourth councillor on standby, just in case uh, somebody's IT connection goes down during the meeting. Okay, now I've been talking a lot about a South Somerset situation. Uh, here it is. This was a planning committee meeting which took place a week or two ago. Um, and um, they, I think, just invite broadcast the details online to anyone and everyone. And it's not surprising that uh, discussion of one of Yeovil's much needed roundabouts was interrupted in the way that South Somerset uh, Live reported. But thanks very much for me. That's um, everything on practical tips. I think we're now going to move to a question and answer session. Yes, thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone else. Um, can we, we've got the, we've uh, chosen, I think, eight questions altogether, and uh, they're now up on the screen. Uh, my apologies if you, if the screen hasn't been catching up with the speaker during the course of the, this morning's performance. That's just another glitch that can happen, and hopefully we'll uh, get on top of that. Anyway, the first question is how do you deal with a party who claims IT problems but might be using it as a delaying tactic? And I'm going to hand this back uh, to Matt. Thank you. Okay, well, um, certainly I've sat as a legal advisor for a lot of authorities that are watching, um, and we won't, uh, we're all familiar with delaying tactics in person meetings um, as well, and now we'll have to deal with them for remote meetings as well. Um, I think this question really relates to Regulation 5 of the flexibility regulations and the conditions for remote attendance. And that means that as a minimum, councillors on the subcommittee need to, be a, need to be able to be heard and to hear um, other councillors, parties to the hearing and members of the public. Now, if practicable, they should also hit, be able to see and be seen, but as a minimum, they need to hear and be heard. Um, now, obviously you, can, you can't really control um, other people's um, technology and you certainly can't verify it where somebody's saying they're having IT difficulties and 
the regulations I think need to be read practically and I think it's sufficient that you've made the facilities available and you've tested them out in advance. I think that satisfies the conditions for remote attendance. But remember what I said about backups and contingencies. Almost all the video, platform, video conferencing platforms I've discussed allow people to dial in over the phone in order to join the meeting and we've got at least a couple of people doing that today. Now that is um, there's not going to be very many cases where somebody can't use a phone to dial in. So as an emergency, I think it would be sufficient to make sure uh, to make sure that participants are at least able to do that if they truly are experiencing IT problems. Thank you, Matt. Um, the, the, that leads into the next question. Can parties object to a remote hearing altogether, um, which I'm going to deal with? Um, in my view, for, partially for the reasons Matt has given, the answer to that is no. Um, if they could do, it could bring um, the whole process to a grinding halt, which is the contrary to the, the whole idea behind the flexibility regulations. A word of caution to add to that answer. In my view, um, you have to be alive to the difficulties people may have in remote hearings, and you have to make allowance for them. Um, so you need to assist them where possible um, and as Matt has just indicated that may mean if they've got problems uh, having video access providing telephone access uh, because as you will recall the flexibility regulations require people to hear and be heard um, as a minimum but only to be seen and see where practical so a telephone connection would be sufficient um, and I'm going to come back to this in, um, in response to a question in a, in a further uh, slide in, in a moment. Um, so that, that's all I had to say under that. Um, the third question is, do we have to provide for parties and their legal represents, representatives, consultants, etc., to speak privately? And uh, I'm going to pass that over to Joe to do that. Um, thanks, Joe. Uh, the short answer is no, I don't think a local authority is required to provide the mechanism for parties to speak privately, but you should definitely facilitate their ability to do so. So often uh, parties will want to do the remote equivalent of passing a post-it note to one another or whispering to each other about a point. And obviously that um, remotely has to be done in a different way. So if you're running a hearing, I think you have to be much more mindful that that sort of thing uh, will need to happen, whether you offer um, explicitly as it were the, the opportunity to have a five minutes to talk or but or just to be much more tolerant of slight delays where it's pretty obvious that someone is whatsapping their legal rep to ask well what you know how should I answer that or you know is that can we mention this thing or whatever so I think the short answer is no you don't have to provide that platform uh, but you do as a local authority have to provide uh, the facility, if you like, or, or you have to facilitate them using whatever platform they choose to be able to speak privately. Thank you, Joe. Then on to the last question on that page. I think that's something that I was hoping Rishi could pick up. Um, yes, James, thanks. So this is something I mentioned briefly when I was doing uh, my bit of the presentation, but in essence, there aren't any specific regulations or, you know, statute based rules that apply to taxi cases. And so um, it, it's always been the case that it's up to local authorities and entirely within their discretion what rules they make to govern taxi licensing hearings. That being said, it has always been and it continues to be the case that, um, you know, you will need to think about common law fairness and issues of natural justice. Um, this is particularly an area where, you know, so as I said previously, someone's livelihood is at stake and you might be revoking or, um, you know, suspending someone's license. And so you need to be quite mindful as to um, what um, kind of a scope there is for um, a fair hearing uh, and ensuring that a fair hearing takes place. But presumably, given that this is, you know, taxi licensing cases aren't new, um, your constitution will already have made provision for it. Um, and as I've said already, to the extent that there's anything preventing um, that hearing to now take place online and virtually, um, that's simply just applied by the flexibility regs. So um, the flexibility regs will, um, you know, kind of sit on top of whatever your rules ordinarily say. Um, thanks, James. That's all for me. Thank you, Rishi. Before we move to the next slide, we've just had a, 
um, a follow-up question in about the likelihood of success on appeal if the uh, licensing authority presses ahead with a hearing in the absence of a party who claims inability to participate. And I think, Matt, um, you were hoping to say something about that. Well, the obvious answer to that uh, question, uh, James and Rachel, is that your chances of success at appeal go up exponentially if you instruct someone from Cornerstone. Um, ultimately, it will depend on the quality of your written reasons. You obviously need to be quite sensitive to the possibility that somebody might not be able to participate fairly in the proceedings. But the law is quite clear that if someone can hear what's going on, then they can um, participate properly in the meeting. And it would be a pretty exceptional case, I think, where somebody can't, as, a very, as an absolute minimum, hear the proceedings by dialing in on the phone. So I'd be relatively confident if I was sitting as a legal advisor, um, advising a chair to carry on with the meeting if we could get somebody in to join the meeting on the phone. Thank you and just whilst you're on Matt there was a, a query about Zoom uh, lacking security because it goes through China. Uh, in, in part you covered that but I just wondered whether you had any specific um, response to Jessica's question about that. Okay, well, in another, in another life, a lot of us do data protection, and data protection is ultimately all about risk assessment. Um, you've got to weigh up the convenience of using something like Zoom uh, against the possible risks of um, the data protection implications of it. Um, I think the risks from a licensing subcommittee uh, hearing, data protection risks are probably fairly small. Um, and I think in most cases, unless you're discussing really sensitive business, and I definitely the UK cabinet have used Zoom to conduct meetings, that's probably not a good idea to be sending data out to China or even, even to the USA. But I think probably for a, um, a licensing subcommittee, it's probably fine to use it. Okay, and then just to really catch you on the hot mat, another question's come in saying, does anyone know what facilities for private chat would be good on Microsoft Teams? That may be beyond your ken, but, um, see if you can just deal with that while we're here. Um, I don't actually use Teams myself because I have a Mac and uh, for some reason it doesn't let me download it. Um, but uh, I think it's talk to your IT colleagues if you're unfamiliar with it. Thank you, Rishi. Can we have the next slide up, please? Um, you've beaten me to it. Um, can deliberations be undertaken in public? Um, Joe, over to you for this one, please. Thanks, James. Um, just before I do, just a bit more for Jessica Farmer's question about um, confidential parts of um, meetings, particularly de deliberations and going through China and so on. Remember that the um, deliberations part of a hearing doesn't, isn't caught by the same requirement to hold a hearing in public. So once you go into a private session, all those things about seen and being see heard and being heard and where practical seen don't, don't apply so you're really just the three subcommittee members and the legal advisor and so you could just as easily do that by a conference telephone call there's, there's there isn't the same requirement to um involve the public obviously because it's in in private session so i think um if you were being cautious about china finding out about the dog and ducks um chances in in the appeal then you could just end the zoom or teams or whatever and deal with it on the telephone or by whatsapp or, or whatever so the, the public element doesn't apply um can deliberations be undertaken in public well yes they they can um camden do it um i think camden do it in pursuit of transparency uh it i think it's fair to say sometimes means that what they talk about is to some extent uh limited and they perhaps don't have quite the same open discussion and Certainly having sat as a legal advisor uh, and sat in on um, deliberations, uh, sometimes the first five or ten minutes is uh, you definitely rather the public wouldn't hear. <laughs> so, uh, yes, they can be undertaken in public, but um, I think generally they should be done in, in private. That, that's my view. Thank you, Joe. Um, moving on to the next question, which is uh, for Ben. Can the leader of the council adjourn? all meetings until a later date. Thank you very much. This is something which um, Joe has already partially covered and it's important, I think, to distinguish between meetings generally and meetings which are covered by the Licensing Act um, regulations. In general, uh, generally speaking, general meetings provided that the leader has powers to adjourn the meeting under the constitution and if not, the leader then, of course, the relevant person under the constitution and adjournments to an unspecified or indefinite date would um, seem to be possible. 
it's probably undesirable to adjourn matters off indefinitely as um, that's obviously just going to lead to a backlog further down the road and realistically conducting remote hearings and meetings is pretty, going to be pretty essential to the proper functioning of local authorities during this period. Um, it, it might mean of course that there are short hiatuses whilst the technology and protocols in, are put in place but hopefully we're, we're sort of through that um, period now or coming through it certainly and that in my view should mean that there, there doesn't need to be the sort of lengthy delays that perhaps this question envisages. Um, it's also worth noting as mentioned by Ruchi and Joe the regulation for the flexibility regulations which gives authorities powers to move or cancel meetings without further notice being given. Um, though of course in exercising those powers uh, the authority will need to be mindful of um, issues of procedural fairness. Um, the situation is, is slightly different under the licensing um, hearing regs, as Joe mentioned, particularly Regulation 11, which requires adjournments beyond the prescribed statutory time limits to be for a specified period. And as a result, simply providing for an indefinite adjournment is, is probably going to be problematic. The requirement is to specify that period forthwith, and so there might that might justify a short delay in notification um, of a new date, but, but simply saying until further notice doesn't seem to me to be appropriate. Um, any adjournment in terms of the Licensing Act regs needs to be necessary in the public interest and therefore when adjournments are being made you're going to need to give reasons which um, reflect and, and give consideration to whether it is really necessary in the public interest. Um, that was my answer to that question. So I'll hand back to James. Thanks, Ben. Very helpful. Um, the next question is, what do we do if parties say they don't have the relevant technology? And in part, we've covered this, both myself and I think Joe and Matt. Uh, but we had a further question in from Paul Weller, who said, is there going to be a perception of imbalance if, if some parties can use the video link and some parties can only use the telephone? Um, that, there may be a perception, but it is it, provided um, you've done as much as possible to avoid uh, the imbalance, the regulations, the flexibility regulations certainly contemplate that some people may not be able to uh, see, um, whereas some can. And so provided parties have, have acted um, sensibly and you've made allowance for problems that people may have in trying to access and, and perhaps assisted them but um, there's only limited assistance that can be given uh, then I in our view um, we don't think that would be a, um, a legal flaw arising from any perception of imbalance. I think you're particularly when license hearings are about a, a personal license that affects somebody's livelihood one has to uh, be aware at all times of the need for fairness and natural justice, uh, but that shouldn't prevent virtual hearings taking place. Uh, so on to our last question, um, and what happens if the live stream fails? And over to Matt on that. Okay, well it's obviously always important to make sure that you don't cross the stream. Um, the live stream is crucial to allow the meeting to go ahead because that's how you enable the public to attend and we know that um, regulation 14 of the hearing regulations says that the hearing must take place in public and in any case it's a general rule of local authority meetings that they uh, also take place in public so that's really important to maintain your live stream and um, if it does fail then the members of the public have effectively been excluded from the hearing. Um, and while there are lawful ways of excluding the public, and Joe discussed those, I don't think this is one of them. So it's really important to, to take the time to try and get the live stream back up. Uh, and that might require a short adjournment while your IT colleagues tinker around with it. Uh, if not, well, what do you do? I think there are two options. Ideally, you would have planned for this and you'd have contingency in place. So you'd uh, remember what I was saying and what James has said, as a minimum, if someone can dial in over the phone, then that's probably um, sufficient to enable the hearing to go ahead. So you'll need to make sure that those contingency plans have been shared in advance and people need to, uh, to people know what to do if the live stream does fail. If it doesn't, or if there is some fundamental issue of fairness at stake, as James said, you have to adjourn um, to another date. Um, 
but the overriding consideration has got to be fairness. And if the only thing, only way of ensuring fairness is an adjournment, well, then adjournment is your answer, I think. Thank you. Just to share some experience, I, I had um, a question from a, um, an authority that will remain unnamed. That they were it was a, it was a planning hearing, so not licensing, but uh, I think it may be of interest. Uh, uh, a contentious hearing. They decided in advance that voting should be done by um, oral answer, and they ran through the councillors. And when it came to the last councillor. Uh, his session had been muted uh, uh, and he couldn't unmute himself. Uh, and um, the uh, monitoring officer or the legal officer advising the chair uh, was uncertain what to do, but put the resolution to him and he was able to hear and he wrote up his answer on a piece of paper and put it up on screen. Now, whilst that may not uh, fit with the terms of the licensing the flexibility regulations which require you to be heard but not necessarily seen in this case it was seen and not heard um, uh, in my view um, his voting intention was made absolutely clear to everyone including the public who are watching and uh, the risk of challenge would be very low and i hope it remains that way we've had one last question that uh, joe has indicated a a keenness to answer, so I shall uh, pass it over to him. Uh, not, not sure about keenness, but I'm, I'm happy to. It's actually a couple of follows up on my point about how you deal with deliberations at the end of the hearing. Do you uh, end the hearing, the public session of the hearing, and then start the new session by telephone or whatever, or do you do it in a breakout room and so on? Um, Guy Bishop, I think very sensibly, says that um, the, the approach that the two authorities he advise, I interpret that this is his advice and I agree with it, uh, is that they close the meeting and then, as I suggested, uh, email the decision in five days. Um, Chinedu says, what about if something arises after you've ended the session? You know the situation that sometimes happens. You go into closed session, uh, the councillors are deliberating and, and someone says, well, what about this condition? Or what about the wording of this condition? And you, uh, you can, in a normal case, go back to the parties in open session. They're usually somewhere near and say, look, we'd like your input on, on this. Now, obviously, if you've ended the meeting, that's going to be quite hard. My view is in that situation is that you email the parties with the query. Uh, you collect the answers and then when you come up with your determination, um, you make sure that somewhere in that determination it's noted that after the hearing ended, the public part of it, you asked that question and the, the replies were X, Y and Z. It's obviously very fact specific and the, the view taken was X, Y and, and Z. J just make clear to those who see the determination that that process happened. Now, yes, that might open up debate yeah but that is a danger just as much with non-remote hearings as it is with remote hearings you just have to manage that so i don't think there's a straightforward um, catch-all answer but i think generally the ending the public session going into private session and then if you need to go back to the parties doing it by email is the safest uh, way to do it thank you joe and thank you all for listening you'll have seen we've overrun we're now been going for nearly an hour which is probably quite long enough for all of you listening to us but i think we've hopefully dealt with all the questions that you had for us. Just to remind you of the first slide, the slides will be available on request and indeed I think they may be emailed to those who have registered. The, there will be a recording of the hearing which will go up on our website. We have a COVID resource which includes all the recordings and um, material that uh, relate to the COVID crisis, not just licensing but other matters as well. Um, and if you have any other questions or instructions or inquiries, all the uh, relevant email addresses are currently on the screen. So thank you very much uh, for listening and um, uh, uh, stay safe. Thank you indeed. Bye now.